Hello and welcome. It's Thursday, the 10th of April. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast here on Adirang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. North Korean leader Kim Jong un is re elected as the first chairman of the country's highest decision making body, the National Defense Commission. South Korea, the US, and Japan hint that they could ease preconditions for the resumption of international talks with North Korea over its nuclear program. Plus, tech firms are encouraging the public to change their passwords amid fears of a security glitch that may have put Internet users' personal data at risk. Our top story this morning, South Korea, the US and Japan are reportedly examining a variety of ways to restart the six-party talks on the denuclearization of North Korea. Choi Yoo-san has the latest from the trilateral talks that took place in Washington earlier this week. South Korea, the U.S. and Japan are considering scaling back the preconditions they want met before resuming talks with North Korea over its nuclear program. Following a meeting of the three countries' nuclear negotiators this week, a South Korean official told reporters in Washington that they're looking at a variety of ways to resume talks with Pyongyang. The official said the three parties are looking at the conditions with a little more flexibility in mind and that the ways in which North Korea shows sincerity about giving up its nuclear weapons program could be up for discussion. The three nations, together with China and Russia, have been trying to denuclearize the North under the six-party framework for more than a decade. But the six-party talks have been suspended since late 2008 because of repeated provocations by Pyongyang. In return for U.S. food aid two years ago, North Korea agreed to suspend its missile and nuclear testing, place a moratorium on its uranium enrichment, and allow international inspectors into its nuclear facilities. Washington and its two main Asian allies have been demanding Pyongyang take additional actions outside of the food for denuclearization framework before returning to negotiations. The official, however, said there's a need for further review and discussions with China, another key six-party member. He then said what's most important is stopping the enhancement of North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities and for the North to leave room for negotiations without carrying out further provocations. Experts in Seoul, however, caution that it's too soon to jump to any conclusions about a change in South Korea's position. Instead, they say this could merely be another message urging Pyongyang to act sincerely and return to the negotiating table. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel has urged Chinese President Xi Jinping to play a larger role in containing the dangers posed in the region by North Korea. The Chinese Defense Ministry said Wednesday that she met with Hegel at the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, but didn't really give any further details. Earlier on his China trip, Hegel had asked Beijing to work more closely with the U.S. and regional partners in responding to Pyongyang's dangerous, destabilizing behavior. The talks between the two came as Hegel came after rather Hegel and China's defense minister exchanged some rather strong words on China's air defense zone over the disputed islands in the East China Sea. Hegel's trip comes at a time of growing regional tensions amid not only North Korea's fresh nuclear test threat, but also growing territorial rivalry between Beijing and Tokyo. Now, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un won re-election from the country's rubber stamp parliament on Wednesday, the first day of the Supreme People's Assembly's first session under Kim's leadership. And despite earlier speculations of a major reshuffle, there were no real significant changes to key posts, our Hwang Sang-hee reports. At the first session of the 13th Supreme People's Assembly on Wednesday, North Korea re-elected Kim Jong-un as the head of the country's highest decision-making body. It was declared that our Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un was confirmed as the first chairman of the National Defense Commission of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The young Kim was named chairman two years ago, capping his rise to power following the sudden death of his father in December 2011. The first session of the country's highest legislative body is an occasion to find out who's in and who's out of North Korea's ruling circle. 
Figurehead President Kim Young-nam remained in office, sitting next to the young Kim and even giving a speech. There had been speculation the 86-year-old was going to step down after 15 years of service. Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un is the most prominent politician of our time. Choi ryong hae the top political officer in North Korean People's Army, who has emerged as a rising star under the young Kim, was elected as one of the three vice chairmen of the powerful National Defense Commission. With that, Choi filled the post that has been vacant since the execution of Chang Song tae once the second most powerful man in North Korea. Prime Minister Park bong ju who is in charge of the regime's economic policies, also remained in office. With no major reshuffle, experts say the young leader will maintain the North's existing policies for now to stabilize his power base. North Korea named Lee Soo-yong, former ambassador to Switzerland, as its new foreign minister. Some say the move reflects the regime's will to bolster its ties with the Western world. Hwang sang Arirang News. Now, amid heightened concerns over South Korea's air defence capacity, Seoul's defence minister was grilled at a parliamentary defence committee meeting on Wednesday over the recent discovery of suspected North Korean drones. Our Jim Young Gil has the details. Parliamentary defence committee lawmakers gathered Wednesday to hear what measures the defence ministry has drawn up to counter the threat of North Koreans' unmanned aerial vehicles. We are worried that the drones may have attack capabilities, that they may even be loaded with nuclear warheads. What measures have you prepared? The suspected North Korean drones do not have the ability to strike targets. They can't be used for acts of terror. But we will quickly reinforce our defenses to better detect and defuse any enemy assets. Part of the plan's defense chief Kim Guanjin laid out include buying advanced low-altitude surveillance radars and anti-aircraft guns. The government is also mulling over providing financial rewards to anyone who reports spotting a drone. But lawmakers also wanted to know why the defense ministry wasn't prepared for an infiltration of small-sized drones in the first place. Small North Korean drones have been flying around the front border line since seven or eight years ago. Don't you think we've neglected this fact? We've been preparing for drone threats since the early 1990s, but we had prepared for small drones that are more than five meters in length. We hadn't received reports of drones smaller than two meters. During the meeting, lawmakers urged the defense ministry to not just rely on the purchase of low-altitude surveillance radars from Israel, but to also launch a colossal revamp of the country's air defense system. As for the North Korean threat of a fourth nuclear test, defense ministry officials said they were monitoring developments at the North Pungeri nuclear site and would work with the UN to impose harsher sanctions in the event a test is carried out. Kim young Arirang News. Now, South Korea's main opposition, uh, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, has backtracked on its promise to abolish the party nomination system before local elections in June. The party said it reached the decision after a public opinion survey and an intra-party vote showed more were in favour of maintaining the current system. This means the party will now select its own candidates to run in the local elections in under two months' time. Abolishing the party-centred nomination system was a key pledge of both the ruling and opposition parties during the 2012 presidential campaigns, with many believing it acts as a breeding ground for bribery and corruption. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia and beyond. On air, on your mobile and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 15 billion years. Millions of websites may have been leaking critically sensitive data for the past two years due to a flaw in software used to encrypt and transmit personal data. Shin Se-min reports. 
Millions of passwords, credit card numbers, and other sensitive information may be at risk from Heartbleed, a security bug in an obscure part of software. The bug was accidentally added to software called OpenSSL that sets up an encrypted data channel between computer users and a website's remote server. A small padlock icon appears on websites using OpenSSL to reassure users, but the so-called Heartbleed loophole could have left it open to exploitation by hackers. A Finnish online security firm and Google Security, who disclosed a threat, say the glitch went undetected for at least two years. Security experts are advising the public to upgrade their own security practices and change all their passwords. Experts fear hackers may have already been exploiting the problem before its discovery. Fortunately, most wager web services such as Google, Yahoo, Facebook and large banks say they have already applied fixes to the affected servers and services. However, smaller websites that rely on OpenSSL could go days or weeks without a fix. The damage caused by the Heartbleed bug is currently unknown. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Apple's lawyers have been breaking down the company's $2.2 billion damages request against Samsung, arguing the Korean company's alleged patent infringement had cost it that much in lost profits and royalties. At the fifth day of their patent trial in California, Apple's damages experts said the huge sum of money was justified due to the scope and timing of the infringement on five of Apple's patents. The U.S. firm says the infringement occurred between August 2011 and December 2013 when the smartphone market was going through a really rapid expansion. Apple also claims Samsung sold more than 37 million products that stepped on its patents during that period. If Apple can convince the jury that the Korean firm is guilty of patent infringement, it can ask the court to ban Samsung from selling its phones and tablets in the U.S. Now, it goes without saying that since its creation all the way back in 1989, the World Wide Web has changed the way we interact, the way we work and the way we live. The future of the web is also being under, is under discussion by some of the greatest minds in the field this week in Seoul. Uh, Kim Jeon filed this report from the World Wide Web Conference 2014. The 23rd Annual International World Wide Web Conference 2014 opened in Seoul on Wednesday. The conference provides the world with a forum to discuss the development of the web, the standardization of its associated technologies, and its impact on society and culture. At this year's conference, co-hosted by KAIS and the Korean Agency for Technology and Standards, experts from a variety of web-related fields address what roles the web plays and what opportunities and challenges lie ahead. Tim Berners-Lee, who first conceived of the World Wide Web in 1989, was among one of the forum panelists that discussed what to expect over the next 25 years. Berners-Lee is part of a movement called The Web We Want that argues for law and order or a bill of rights of sorts for online freedom and impartiality. He said the openness of the web is currently under threat by big governments and conglomerates worldwide. And people and we all start taking the web more for granted, then there will be, uh, there will be other things that maybe that we get access to. So the, there will be questions like, will the, um, the in, in incredible open software for, which allows you to get uh, open courseware? Like Berners-Lee goes as far as to say that the web as we know it today could suddenly disappear in the future, where larger entities would put more clamps on the freedoms we currently enjoy. He said the public needed to be more aware of the possibility. On Thursday, the forum will focus more on how to tame the web and its many dangers, such as privacy and security breaches. The forum held in Seoul runs until Friday. Kim ji Arirang News. And this just coming in, Korea's central bank has left its key interest rate unchanged for the 11th straight month in April at 2.5%. And we'll bring you details on that in our next newscast at noon, Korea time.
And now for a look at the international headlines we're following at this hour. We're going to turn it over to our Eunice Kim, who's standing by, as always, at the news centre. Good morning to you, Eunice. Now, amid the political uncertainties in Thailand, the US, I believe, has expressed its concern over a possible military coup. Hi, Mark. That's right. We're learning that the U.S. State Department raised the concern in a letter. According to acting Thai Foreign Minister Sudapong Toi Chak Chai Khun, the U.S. government is concerned over possibilities that the Thai political conflict will intensify to the extent of prompting a military coup to overthrow the elected government. The letter was delivered by U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Daniel Russell during a meeting with acting Thai Prime Minister Ying Lak Shinawat. Thailand has been mired in political conflict for the past six months as anti-government protesters have called for Prime Minister Shinawat to step down. Its government currently serves in a capacity of caretaker, which prohibits it from engaging in any major ASEAN-related business. And staying in Southeast Asia, we turn next to some of the pre preliminary vote results following Wednesday's massive elections in Indonesia. In the lead is the country's biggest opposition party, the Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle, with about 20 percent of the votes, five percent more than the second or that, than the runner-up, rather, a traditional longtime ruling Golkar party. Its lead gives popular Jakarta governor and its presidential hopeful Joko Widodo a boost. The the world's third largest democracy after India and the U.S. will pick its next president on July 9th. 187 million people in three time zones were eligible to cast their votes Wednesday and selected from a pool of some 200,000 candidates vying for 20,000 openings, including those at provincial and local levels. Official results will be released next month. And Greece will reissue sovereign bonds on this Thursday for the first time in nearly four years. This after facing an economic crisis that rocked Europe and nearly got itself pushed out of the Eurozone two years ago. The move is meant to send a strong economic and political message of its strides out of the that crisis. Reuters, citing a Greek government official, reported Greece is aiming to raise up to 2.5 billion euros issuing the five-year bonds. The price has yet to be set, but Greece has already attracted more than $15 billion of investor interest. The Greek economy has been sustaining on EU and IMF bailout funds and treasury bills. The Ukrainian government has posed an ultimatum to pro-Russian separatists occupying state buildings in eastern cities, enter talks or be forced out. Interior Minister Arsen Avakov said either way the situation would be resolved within 48 hours. Some have chosen to leave a Luhansk security service office. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin suggested that state-run gas company Gazprom should require Ukraine to pay up front for its gas. Ukraine owes Gazprom 2.2 billion U.S. dollars and remains at the brink of bankruptcy. And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off in the PGA. Of course, on Thursday, U.S. time, the 2014 PGA Masters will kick off at the Augusta. And while the event is arguably one of the biggest annual sporting events, fans will not be able to see a familiar face in Tiger Woods, who's out with an ongoing injury. Fans here in the nation will be cheering on KJ Choi, a.k.a. Che Kyung Ju and Y.E. Yang or Yang Yong Un. Meanwhile, Adam Scott, who's won last year's event, hopes to repeat his performance this year as well. And over to domestic football, where the Elang Group has stated that they will start a new K-League team starting next season. Now, having previous experience running a football team from 1992 to 1998 with the Elan Pumas in a semi-professional league, the company, which once tried to purchase the L.A. Dodgers, will now create a professional football team in the K-League. They plan to join the second-tier K-League Challenge in 2015 and plans to play at the Chamshir Sports Complex. Meanwhile, they also plan to make their official statement at a press conference on the 14th. 
And staying with domestic football, let's take a look at some Wednesday night's K League Classic action as Suwon defeats Chunnam 1 0, with Cheju United beating Chunbuk 2 0. Meanwhile, the Pong Steelers crush the Kyungnam FC 3 0, and Sungnam upsets Ulsan 1 0. With that, let's take a look at the Sangju's military team take on FC Seoul. Of course, both teams evenly matched early on here, but in the 29th minute, it's Sangju's Hate Gyun who finds the back of the net, giving Sangju the 1 0 first half lead. Going over to the second half, 59th minute, it's Escudero to the rescue as he sends one past the goalkeeper, and we're tied 1 1. 65th minute, a red card is issued to Yang Jun Ai, and Sangju is a man down. But no matter, national team member Lee Gun Ho in the 70th minute, he heads this one in, giving Sangju the upset one here. Here is the final score 2 to 1. And now moving over to some Wednesday night's KBO action as the Red Hot NC Dinos beat the Hanwha Eagles 6-2 with the Nexon Heroes beating Kia Tigers 10-7. And the SK Wyverns beat the Tucson Bears 5-4. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the LG Twins take on the Lotte Giants. Of course, going into the game here, bottom of the first, Sonas up, drills this pitch to deep right center field and back, 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 back. Got a solo shot, gives the Lotte Giants the early 1-0 lead. But shifting to the fourth inning, bases loaded for Lee byung and the first pitch he sees, drills it to right and there it goes. A grand slam puts LG up 4-1. But the bottom of the inning with a man on here is Kang Min Ho. Sends one deep to left field. Going, going, gone. A two run shot. Cuts the deficit to four to three. Sixth inning this time here is Park Jong Yoon. Singles to center. In comes Sonas up. And we have a brand new ball game tied four to four. Eighth inning, Lee Jin Young. A clutch sack fly to right field. Gives the LG Twins the 5 4 lead. Before the Twins add two more in the ninth as they beat the Lotte Giants seven to four. And now finishing things off in women's college basketball, if you're a student at University of Connecticut or went to the school, 2014 is surely a year of celebration for the basketball fans. Now, after the men's team claimed their national championship, so did the women's team. Now, led by Brianna Stewart and her 21 points and 9 rebounds, the Huskies beat the University of Notre Dame 79-58. to With the win, the team has now won a record ninth national championship. Meanwhile, it was a painful loss for University of Notre Dame, who have now lost three national championships in the past four years. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Well, it's hazy again here in the capital this morning, but that will clear out as the day goes on. But we have unwelcomed guests. It's yellow dust, and yellow dust could sweep the western parts of the regions in the morning hours. And clouds will be a bit stubborn with partially clearing by later this afternoon. And due to northeasterly winds, the regions in the east coast will have a somewhat chilly day today. So temperature-wise, it will be similar to warmer than yesterday in the west, while areas in the east will have cooler daytime highs compared to yesterday. And it looks like the atmosphere will remain quite dry. I mean, it's hard not to notice how dry it is. Uh, we know that dry windy condition, though, it increases the risk of fires. So please be extra cautious to prevent fires. Uh, but thankfully, we do have welcome rain on the way to take out some of the dryness in the air. Tomorrow will be another warm and dry day. But Rain is on the forecast on Saturday. It's going to start from down south, then expand to nationwide on Sunday. So please do keep that in mind. And let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The afternoon high in the capital will jump up to 20, while Daegu gets up to 19, and Gwangju and Busan should top out at 24 and 19, respectively. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju and Daejeon will pick at 19 and 20. Two, while Mount Kungang should see a high of 
8 this afternoon. Well, that's all I have for you at this hour and hope you have a wonderful start to the day. And that's all for now. We'll be back at noon Korea time. It's always worth checking out our website if you have the chance, and that can be found at adidang.co.kr forward slash news.